Nice to see you all. Okay, so I'm going to go through this very full slide here, which is a flow of garbage collection. Don't worry about it if you can't follow it all, because I'm going to go through it. That's exactly what the talk is about, following this flow that tells you step by step how to uh, tune garbage collectors, uh, tune your JVM rather with the garbage collection. Um, there's a couple of slides. There's, uh, if you look at, uh, going back to that first one, off to the side there, there's a latency tuning flow, and that goes into this slide here. So the talk's going to go through all the slides, uh, through all that flow. You don't have to uh, memorize it or take the photos now. Uh, but if you understood everything, that's it. You can go to another talk. That's, uh, that's fine. That's the, the full details of the talk. Um, so in my description for this talk, I said that there were 120 GC tuning flags, seven different garbage collectors, memory spaces, pools, logs. There was a slight mistake there. It's actually 12 different garbage collectors because there are two JVMs in the OpenJDK now. Uh, they're both very mature. You're probably using the hotspot one, which is the one that's uh, um, delivered by Oracle, built by Oracle. But there's also the IBM one, which is called OpenJ9. Um, so that's a very mature one. It's been around almost as long as the Oracle one. Um, it, it was used originally. IBM built it internally for their own products. And it's been around for 20 years. And they finally decided to open source it. And so it's now part of the OpenJDK. If you go and download an OpenJDK uh, VM, JVM, it gives you the choice of which one you want to download, whether you want to download Hotspot or the OpenJ9 one. You can download both. There's no problem. Um, and they have it for all the versions, pretty much, uh, of OpenJDK has both of, those collect, uh, both of those JVMs. So you have 12 garbage collectors to choose from, which is, yay, more options, right? More options, great, great. Uh, a lot of people have the version of, oh, no, more options. What do I do now? What am I going to do? Why the There's too many options. Yeah, well, don't panic, because that's exactly... My attitude to too many options is, oh my god, what am I going to do here? So what I do is I sit down and I try and come up with a step-by-step -step process to see which options are the right ones for which situations. I try and tend to do that for all of the things that I look at. Um, and I've done that for uh, garbage collectors. So these, the, this talk is actually the outcome of a course I developed within Expedia. So I work for Expedia Group. Hotels.com is one of the brands in Expedia Group. There's actually a lot of brands in Expedia Group. This is, uh, this is the Expedia Group brand portfolio. Uh, you've probably used one or two of them when you've gone on holiday. Um, so that's the, this, uh, this talk came out of the courses that I built there for Expedia Group. And, um, uh, and this tuning flow um, it is a new one that I've put together, and uh, it, it, it looks like it's a very nice one. So before I go into that flow, there's just some things that are useful, not essential. So if you fall asleep now and come back when I start going through the flow, that's fine. Uh, but these are kind of useful things for you to know uh, just as you're doing any kind of tuning. The first thing is the garbage collector isn't just something you turn on and it collects the garbage. Because it has to manage the memory allocation of all those objects that it's collecting, it actually needs to know where that memory is. And in order to do that, it also needs to, it basically, it needs to allocate the objects so that it gives the, the correct layout for the memory and it knows where that, where that memory is used because it's going to recover that or it's going to move it. Um, so basically, there's a lot of things that the garbage collector does. It's a lot more than just collecting the garbage. There's the allocation. There's the full layout. It has to track the objects because it's going to manage those objects all through the life of those objects. Um, and it also needs to put in the JIT compilation codes for the, for the just-in-time compiler because when you're looking at creating, allocating, and moving those objects, the compiler needs to know about that. So the, the garbage collection actually feeds into the whole structure of the JVM. It's not a simple, straightforward, just little plug-in at the end. It's actually very integral to the JVM. 
one of the consequences of that is that you can't just flip garbage collector halfway through running. Um, there are other th parameters that you can turn on and off, but the garbage collection be collector, because it's so integral to the JVM, when you start the JVM, you start the garbage, garbage collector of your choice, and it runs for the entire lifetime of that JVM. So that's something that's uh, worth knowing about. And in particular, the garbage collector is in charge of allocation, and that's quite important. There's another aspect is that uh, garbage collectors, a lot of them, not all of them, have two generations. Um, there's a reason for that. It's because uh, a lot of analysis finds that uh, very short-lived objects are, uh, oh, a lot of objects are very short-lived, and you can collect them very quickly with a very fast collector, uh, but it might be slightly inaccurate. And then a, a more accurate correct collector can be slower, but can run more infrequently. Um, so it's usually called young and old generation. Um, so there is one specific tuning consequence, which is you need to try and have objects collected in the young generation. That's true, actually, if you're programming, it means that you want to create short-lived objects. Um, and certainly when, you, when you're tuning garbage collection, you want to see that the objects are collected in the young generation as, as much as possible. And just a bit of uh, uh, terminology there. When an object goes from the young to the old generation, it's called being promoted. It's a promotion. And when, they're the, when they get to the old generation, they're tenured. And this is from uh, college nomenclature. This is from people, at, professors at university get promoted to a professorship. And then when they get to uh, stay there permanently, they're, they're tenured. So that's where the naming came from. Um, obviously, this is from uh, academia originally. So there's a, there's a bunch of collectors and words, phrases that uh, I've, I've got a, another slide, two slides here, uh, which I'm just going to go through. They're not essential. Again, this is all useful to know things, but not essential. But it's kind of useful to know. So a heap, that's where objects are created. Um, so there is a memory allocation in the JVM, and it's called a heap. And in fact, there could be several heaps. GC roots is. That's critical to the garbage collection. So the way every garbage collector determines what is garbage and what isn't is that it starts from a set of roots, which are typically the static, um, the, the classes, uh, the static fields, the threads. Those, those are the kinds of things. So if you start from a thread and you look at everything the thread is connected to, that's all the local variables, the thread still has live, things like that. Any static members, you, you go from a static field to an object, to another object, to another object, and so on. That's like a big mesh of objects. Um, so those things the root, are called the roots, where it starts from, to decide what is live. Everything that you can see from a root somewhere, it doesn't have to be immediately from the root, it can be eventually. Uh, linked from one object to the next, that's, um, that's live, and everything else is dead. So that starts from the GC roots. A mark and sweep algorithm is where it does that, where it just goes from the GC roots, it marks everything that's alive, and then it sweeps away everything else. That's what that's called. Compaction, if you're used to, I should have added fragmentation and compaction. So if you're, let's say your, your disk gets fragmented, you need to defragment it. The same with memory. Uh, and it means that if you think of the easiest thing is to think about when you're parking cars and you find you're, you're going along and you find there's one car that's taken up the slot that you could fit two cars in, but he's got in the middle there. Yeah. And so he's taking up two car parking spaces. That's fragmentation and compaction will be moving that car so you can fit your one in there. Um, and that's very useful if you because if you're uh, fragmented m uh, memory, then uh, it means that there's a lot of wasted space. So uh, a, a compaction becomes essential to, uh, to actually use the memory efficiently. A copying collector um, takes objects and moves them into a new space, and it does that as part of a compaction process. So it only takes the live ones, and then the dead ones it doesn't have to worry about because it's, uh, everything that's left over in that old space is dead. It can just zero that out. Um, Concurrent and parallel, okay? So these are things that people get confused. Within garbage collection terminology, they're very, very specific. Parallel means multiple threads. So a parallel garbage collector has multiple threads running doing the garbage collection at the same time. 
Concurrent means that it runs at the same time as your application. So typically, a garbage collection at some point pauses your application. And the ones, the worst ones, the, the ones with the longest pauses, pause your application for a long time. Um, and the ones that are concurrent try to do very short or almost no pauses. So concurrent is it tries to collect the garbage while your application continues to run. Um, you can be concurrent and parallel. You can be one or the other. Uh, but th that's the distinction. Parallel is the number of threads. Concurrent means it's running alongside your application. They're both running at the same time. Um, so that's also concurrent versus stop the world. Stop the world is where it stops your application. Your application is the world. OK, and just a few more here, a region. So the mo more modern uh, garbage collectors try to break up the whole of the heap into li regions, little, little areas. And so that way, it can collect each region separately. And that means that it can uh, be much more effective in the pause, which is the time that it takes the time that it stops your application running in order to do the garbage collection. In order to get to do a garbage collection, it has to hit a safe point. A safe point is where the JVM actually has codes in your, J in your JIT compiled code, and it turns off your application. It stops your application. That's called a safe point. Uh, promotion and tenuring we talked about. Finalizers are where there's a finalize method in object, in the very object class. If you're calling finalizers, or if you're using a reference object, which is the better way of doing a finalization of, a, of an object, then the, that allows um, the garbage collector to collect objects that are uh, no longer referenced, but you have an internal weak reference um, to them. And then finally, Metaspace and perm space. So metas these are the spaces outside of the main heap where the objects are collected. Um, and the meta uh, data of the JVM, so basically class structure, are held there in metaspace. Perm space is the old name for that. It was a different kind of space. Perm space was a heap. Metaspace is now native uh, memory. Um, so just, you just need to know about those rather than them being important. OK. So now we're going to get past that. Um, let's look at the garbage collectors that there are. So as I said, there are those two JVMs. There's the Hotspot one, and there's the OpenJ9 one. Hotspot has seven GC algorithms, and OpenJ9 has a six. Um, one of them is the same um, in, in both of them. It's called Epsilon, and it's basically the no garbage collector. It doesn't do garbage collection. And you'd say, well, how's that a garbage collector? But remember, all the other things that the garbage collector does, the Epsilon garbage collector needs to do all those. The only difference is Epsilon, when it comes to its first garbage collection, it just terminates the JVM. And why would you want that? Mainly for testing, but also if you're an application that does no garbage collection, this is ideal. And there are some applications, very, very lo ultra low latency applications, um, and some batch processing where they just have a very large heap, you can use that. So every garbage collector has the XMX option, all JVMs do. That sets the size of the heap, and that is always the primary tuning option. That's the one that gives you your biggest bang, bang for your buck. And so I'll just list the garbage collectors because they split up into quite a useful uh, set. There's obviously there's the Epsilon one, the no, no garbage collection. Um, that's in the two different, uh, the use Epsilon GC, that's in Hotspot, and the XGC policy, no GC, is in OpenJ9. So that's, and that's, that's uh, typical is that OpenJ9 uses that minus XGC policy flag, and Hotspot uses the minus XX plus use something GC um, as their pattern. So the serial garbage collector is actually the very first garbage collector, the one that it started, all started with in the very first uh, JVM. Um, and it's still around there, and it's actually still useful. And it becomes chosen automatically if you're running on one vCPU. So if you're running in a container, and the container is only allocated one, C one core, then it'll end up turning on the used serial GC if you're running hotspot. And then there's two collectors down here at the bottom, which are the throughput collectors. 
Uh, they're optimized for a throughput. And then on the next page are all the rest of them, which are targeted at pause time. So you can see that pause time tends to be the bigger problem in Java. And that's typical of garbage collection generally, because the difficulty is trying to get the pauses small enough while the garbage collector runs. It's very easy to just stop the application and then trigger a garbage collection and run for ages and do it very efficiently. But that's a very big pause. Um, so there's a lot of collectors that are targeted at pause time. So now we're going to go back to that tuning flow. Let me see if I have, yep, I've got it there. So I'm going to flip between the slides and that flow so you can wear it, see where we are. So the first step here in the flow, all the way at the top left, is start. Turn on GC logging. That's the very first step. Um, and this is really important because although you can also see GC uh, statistics through um, JConsole or the, uh, uh, any of the other tools that access the JMX um, uh, metrics, they, it, there's nothing that actually um, stores those permanently. And you really need to be able to see the, uh, the, the logs afterwards in order to be analyzed uh, data. There is negligible overhead in logging. So it's really, really recommended by everybody to turn on GC logging. The only problem, at, problem might be that it would fill up your disk, in which case there is this um, rotation. So you can limit the amount of disk space it's used, and it'll rotate the files. Um, and up down at the bottom there, I've also got the uh, Java 8 uh, um, uh, parameters to use for this similar sort of thing. But from Java 9 on, there was this standardized JVM logging. And that's what it looks like now. So do turn that on. That's the very first step. The next step, right on from turn on GC logging, is have targets. So SLOs, we, we love three-letter acronyms, the TLAs. SLOs are the service level objective, and it means a target. Okay, so But it's the standard way IT is now referring to targets. It's service level objectives. Now, oops, sorry, that's the wrong one. The thing is that in garbage collection tuning, time literally is money, because every millisecond tighter for your target does cost you. It costs you effort. It costs you tuning effort. It'll cost you development effort, potentially. It'll cost DevOps time. It, it, it's really important that you get, you, you target what's appropriate for your business case and not just, I want it as fast as possible. Because if you come to me and you say, I want it as fast as possible, I'll say, OK, that means you're coding on field programmable get, you know, FPGAs, right? Because that's as fast as possible. So you've got, you've got your embedded FPGAs, and you've got that network card that's uh, probably got the FPGA in it with a direct connector, and you're not even using any kind of computer because that's as fast as possible. So typically, nobody really wants it as fast as possible because that's really expensive. It's very, very expensive to get it as fast as possible. So it is important. And the thing is that um, you can't just use garbage collector targets uh, for your SLOs because they don't map directly. So let's say, for example, your target for your request was 100 milliseconds 99.9% .9 of the time. Um, uh, does that mean that every garbage collection has to be under 100 milliseconds? Well, actually, it, could, it might have to be much under 100 milliseconds because the processing time of your request has to be included with the garbage collection pause. But then what if the garbage collection pause only happens one in 10,000 requests, in which case, actually, it could be much longer than 100 milliseconds because it doesn't matter if it would only hit a small percentage of your requests, uh, and all the rest could be really fast. So it's not a direct one-to-one -one relationship. If your target is 100 milliseconds, you can't say the garbage collector has to pause has to be 100 milliseconds or less. So forget about the garbage collection pause time directly. Look at your business SLOs and have t those targets have very specific business level SLOs. That's really important because otherwise you end up over-tuning or hitting the wrong thing. And that's a Gary Larson cartoon that I love. And the picture there, if you can't see it, has a whole load of 
relativity, general relativity equations ending up in the dollar sign, equal the dollar sign. Um, I couldn't find any attributable cartoon, so I used the, uh, the Amazon snapshot. Um, so we've done those first two. We've, done, we've turned on GC logging. We've made sure we've got targets. Um, the next step should be set XMX, but actually before we go there, we're already using a garbage collector, right? We've started already with whatever garbage collector has been defaulted to, because we haven't set anything yet. We haven't chosen one. And the default, and this is true of every default you get in IT, is not optimal. They're never, ever optimal. But they are often good enough. That's the point of a default, is that it is something which, for most applications, is good enough. And that's why they choose the default. And that means that it's good enough, but it's never optimal for your application. But it might be good enough, so you know, there's, a matter of, there's effort involved in tuning, so it might be good enough, just it's a good place to start. So the XMX, we're back here. We're on the third box here, set XMX. That's the very first stage. Well, what do you start with? Well, maybe you already know, maybe you've already got set XMX set, which is fine, move on to the next step. If you don't, then a good place to start is the live set of your application. So the live set, if you look at a garbage collector graph, the live set is where your heap goes back to after all the GCs. Should be some kind of level. And that's essentially all the uh, memory that your application is taking in its standard running mode, um, ignoring the objects that it's creating, which will then be garbage collected. So ignoring the temporary objects, that's your live set. And you can see that fairly clearly if you look at uh, the garbage statistics and you look at the, uh, the, um, the graph using any mechanism you want to look at, use. Uh, you can use, there, there, are log, there are log viewers that will show you the, the graphs from the uh, logs that we created, or you can use the JMX tools, JVisual VM, JConsole, any of the plug, plugins that let you look at the garbage collector. Uh, and you'll see a steady state for your application, and that steady state is the live set in terms of the heap. Then you want to set the XMX to twice that live set as a start. If you don't know where to start, that's a good place to start. Um, and then, typically, you will lower XMX or increase XMX in response to how it's responding to your SLOs. Next step, we're on to the fourth one at the top there. After set XMX, eliminate memory leaks. Um, this is, this is important because there's really no point in tuning the garbage collection if you've got a memory leak, because all that happens is that it doesn't matter what you do, it's never good enough. A memory leak just means that the heap's going to get full up, and eventually you're gonna, your JVM's going to die. Um, if you were here last year, I did a talk exactly on analyzing and fixing memory leaks. Uh, but if you weren't here, there's a, a shorter version of it, um, which is online here. And that is available for you to, to look through. It's about half an hour. It's quite good. And this is how to do it in one slide. This is the full set of that talk. So uh, if you understand that entire slide and how to follow it through, that's great. But it's fairly straightforward. I mean, it looks complex. It uses a lot of different tools. That's the reason it's complex. But it's not actually complex in terms of doing. It's a, it's a straightforward step-by-step -step process. This talk gives you that step-by-step -step process. This slide actually tells you exactly what you need to do. Uh, but it's more of a memory rather than start here. It's better to start at the talk. But really, it's not difficult to fix memory leaks. Um, and it's not even difficult to find them or uh, understand them. There are some types of memory, memory leaks that are difficult. There's about 20%. It's the 80-20 rule as usual. There's 20% that are really hard. Uh, last year, there was a talk by Ryan Kuprak uh, looking at very difficult memory leaks, the kind where um, every object has a, a field which is duplicated. And that's really hard to find because you can't just look at the root because everything is actually valid except for the leaf nodes have some duplication. Uh, and that's, kinda, that's a really difficult thing to, to find. Um, Ryan Kuprak gave a talk. So if you look at last year's uh, talks, then look at Kuprak's talk. And that was quite, quite, quite a good one on that. But for most memory leaks are typical. Uh, and this will find most of them and show you how to fix them too. So 
going back to our flow there, we've turned on juicy logging, we've got our targets, we've set XMX, we've eliminated memory leaks, finally we're ready to get into the core thing. Now the important thing, really important thing, is to make sure that your JVM is not paging during the garbage collection because that makes everything, that just swamps everything, that dominates, that makes everything much slower. Um, so it's really important to, to monitor the OS paging and see if the garbage collection is triggering that. Then we're on to why is the garbage collection failing or why is your SLO failing? Uh, is it from any of these latency throughput, footprint, startup time or CPU utilization? That's the categories where uh, it might cause your SLO to fail, your targets to fail. So I'm going to go through them from the right, sorry, from this side, the client side close to me, the CPU utilization, through across to latency. I'll go through them that way. And the first one is from CPU utilization. So typically, if that's high, then what's happened is that the garbage collector has too many threads. So JVMs, the modern JVMs are container aware. If you've given the container a certain number of uh, cores, the JVM should set the garbage collector to have at most that many threads, but maybe you're not using a container, maybe you, maybe it didn't pick it up, whatever, or maybe even though you've given the container a certain number, you, it's still swamping the, the CPU utilization, even for the container or for the box, in which case you need to set that. So there's, that's fairly straightforward. Just scale down the garbage collector, it's reduce the number of threads it uses. Of course, there might be other reasons why your SLO is failing from CPU utilization that are not garbage collector related. That's not relevant here because this is garbage collector tuning. So the next one here is startup time. We're moving on to the next one. Let's look at startup time. Typically, that's not garbage collector related, right? Because you, you don't get very much in the way of garbage collection at startup, uh, and it shouldn't really stop your startup. But potentially, it might have one very long pause that's causing your startup to uh, to reduce, um, and it, to, to, to take longer rather. And in that situation, just try a different collector because at startup, they're all gonna be different, they're all gonna work differently, and that will make, it'll just give a different profile completely. Um, so typically just switching collector to any other one will improve your startup time. Um, and if you're looking at other aspects of startup that are not GC related, the most important things are, so you really wanna use the latest JVM because all of these things, are being targeted now in the latest JVMs. Um, class data sharing, that's improving in each JVM recently. Uh, ahead of time compilation, there are aspects of your methods, which your methods are JIT compiled. Now they're being able to be, that, that JIT compilation is being able to be stored. So you can restore it at startup time and that speeds up startup. Um, if not, then there's tiered compilation, which should be the default, but you should check that it's, it's, uh, it is running tiered compilation because that will make the compilation quicker initially and, and speed up start startup. Um, and of course, you need to make sure that your application can start up independent of the JVM uh, causes. Your application itself should be able to start up quickly. And there's one last point is uh, try setting XMS, which is the initial heap size to XMX because that's one less thing that the JVM would have to do as it uh, starts is growing the heap to up to the XMX. If it needs to do that, it'll start off with the XMX. Um, so the next one in this scenario, we've done CPU utilization, we've done startup time. The next one is footprint. Maybe your SLO is fading from footprint. That's pretty simple usually. It's just lower your XMX and you want to keep lowering your XMX until your, still, your SLOs are still being achieved. Um, obviously, you can't lower it below the live set because that'll just mean out of memory errors. Um, so at some point, if you lower this enough, you'll get out of memory errors. But again, that should fail your SLOs. So basically, you just lower XMX until it's as low as possible. There are some applications that have to have a large heap for spike processing. Um, basically, it just lets stuff queue up to a larger size in certain scenarios. Um, but even, and in those, and there are those apps which can, that don't mind having a large heap, but there are some that need to have 
a potential large heap but want the heaps kept as small as possible when it's not in the spike situation. And for those, um, you'd have to test. You have to test between the, the ones there at the bottom. Um, the best option is actually a Java 8 one that was, that was retired. So there was, you were able to do the parallel young generation with the serial old, and that was specifically targeted at keeping the heap minimum. And they retired that in Java 8 because it was a combination that is, they didn't want to support anymore, um, which is a bit of a shame. But what, uh, so I fed back to them that that was the best, you know, I call it bi-stable option. Um, so what they've done is they put some effort into G1 minimizing heaps when it's, it's running. So G1 might well be the best scenario, especially with string deduplication. So if you don't know about string deduplication, um, that's an option for the G1 garbage collector, which if you turn it on, it tries to minimize the memory used by your strings by finding any strings that are duplicated and then only holding one copy in memory. So that's pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Try that one, I would say that might give you the best, but it's very difficult to know. It depends very much on the application and the process. So you need to try those three options, uh, or the fourth one if you're running in Java 8. So we've gone through CPU utilization, startup time, footprint, and now we're on throughput. So throughput, um, the, having throughput as your priority and choosing a GC, that's fairly straightforward because there are basically two garbage collectors which are targeted at throughput. And that's the parallel garbage collector and the op throughput garbage collector. Sometimes you choose a parallel garbage collector, you choose a throughput, but then even after you've chosen throughput because it's the most important, there are still bad pause times. Um, so you want to maintain the throughput as your target, but you want to try and get the pause times down a bit. Uh, and it's useful to know that the parallel garbage collector actually has, as its primary target, pause time. It's unusual, and very few people realize this. In fact, it's the, the primary target, but it will affect your throughput. So you don't want to put the, the pause time too, too low for this. You want to make sure that it's a reasonably reasonable for your SLO pause time. So if, if your throughput is the priority, pause time shouldn't matter that much. It might, you might just want to decrease it a bit. Uh, from some, some max pauses, uh, because it will impact your throughput. And there is uh, one of the OpenJ9 tries to, the Gen Con one, tries to balance the pause and throughput, so you could flip to that one as well. Um, so all of that, honestly, it, it's fairly, it depends very much on your targets, your service level objectives, and which one you choose, and which, what is failing. This is, it's kind of straightforward. Um, I've had a lot of people come to me over the years asking for this kind of flow, and it wasn't really available until now, because until now, for the most part, we haven't had the range of garbage collectors that we could choose and see which ones are optimized. The last, if you look at the latency one, the last 10 years has been people desperately trying to tune CMS using very obscure flags to get it better and better. Um, but now we're in a much better situation. So the situation is, from the last decade to now, the situation's completely changed. Um, so the next one, that's the latency. And yeah, this is where really the big benefits come in recently of the, uh, the choices among garbage collectors. So there are two strategies for targeting uh, latency. Um, one is to just do the same garbage collection, but keep the pauses really short by just collecting little pieces of garbage collection. So you can't do that. You can't just create a, a random garbage collector and do that. You have to build that into the core of your garbage collector by building the garbage collector so that it does. If you remember all the way back to the words, I said regions. It does like little regions of them at a, at a time. Um, because otherwise, there's no way for the garbage collector to know when to stop. Um, unless it's done the full garbage collection. So that's one mechanism. And the other mechanism is to run concurrently. So run your application, let it carry on running while the garbage collector runs. And that means that it's going to be using a lot more CPU, because your application needs all the CPU, CPU that it's already using, but then the garbage collector needs CPU at the same time. So it's going to need more CPU, and typically more memory as well, because 
all of that garbage collection processing needs somewhere to, to happen. It's essentially another application running at the same time as your application. So this is where it's really important to know that the smaller the pause time you want, the higher the overhead, the more it's going to cost you. So we're going to go over to the latency tuning flow. Um, and the, it, it, in some ways, it's quite simple. Because if you want under one millisecond pauses, you forget it. You can't have garbage collection. <laughs> there, it, it's not entirely true. There are some applications that run with a garbage collector with about 750 milliseconds, maybe 600 milliseconds. But you see these um, colored icons on the right. A simple application that creates only very short-lived objects. That's the kind of application. It's a small, limited application that does kind of straightforward processing. It's got a request coming in. It processes that. Request goes out. That's the kind of thing where you will be able to get sub one millisecond pauses with a garbage collector. Uh, but it's got to be really simple and straightforward. It's, uh, um, I think, the kind of example they have are the equity processing ones where you've got a fixed message coming in. It just processes that and then sends it out on, on to the next process. That's the kind of thing where you might be able to manage with a garbage collector. Typically, under one milliseconds is not achievable for most garbage collectors. If you want to hit just around the one millisecond, I say one to two, it's say one to five milliseconds, um, then you have a very strict limited set. So ZGC, it was originally called Zero GC, and then they changed it quickly to ZGC, and I couldn't find anywhere why they called it that. Um, that's an Oracle product, which originally was going to be, they were going to charge people for it, but then it's all gone open, open source now. Um, Shenandoah is Red Hat's garbage collector, also targeted at low, low pauses. Metronome is the IBM one, which I think they acquired. Um, and it, so ZGC and Shenandoah do that uh, running the garbage collector concurrently with your application. Metronome takes the little regions. It tries to do regions as small as possible. Um, and they say three milliseconds, but um, it's, it's, I've actually found it difficult to get metronome working on a lot of uh, systems. It seems quite limited. Mind you, ZGC is also currently limited to Linux, I think. It's about to, to get Windows as well. Um, so some of these aren't available on all systems in all combinations, and that's one of the limitations that you have. Uh, and GenCon plus concurrent scavenge is probably the, the most mature of these, but it's not fantastically good at low pauses. Um, although if you're using an IBM ZOS, <laughs> which is uh, IBM mainframe, then that's, that's got hardware support, so it's quite good there. Um, so in that scenario where you want that very low pauses under five milliseconds, you need to have everything. You need to have no large object graphs. So this is like, if you're thinking about an XML, you're getting in an XML uh, document, and you create uh, an, an in-memory in XML document, and then you reload that when you get the next version or you're re uh, restoring it. That's the kind of thing that's a, a large object. If you try and reload that, there's no garbage collection that can manage that in, in any reasonable length of time. So you can't do that kind of thing. Um, the other, you have to have a lot of additional CPU and memory for uh, all of those guys. And also, it's only, you're only going to reach those low pauses with a fairly simple application. Around 10 milliseconds. So I say around. It could be you know, up to 30, 40 milliseconds, um, but down to five. So a, a wide range of around. It's the same set, but actually, the application doesn't have to be so simple. So this is a more common thing. Your average application, um, as long as it's not doing large object reloads, it can reach that kind of level. Um, but it depends very much on you giving it sufficiently extra memory and sufficiently extra CPU to do that, because that's all running in parallel. And then if you're looking at the 100 millisecond pause time, um, again, if you have lots of CPU and additional memory available, it's still that same set, just less restricted in terms of what it can do. If you don't have additional memory, lots of additional memory in CPU, then there's yet another object, uh, another target here, which is can you manage fragmentation? So if 
Uh, specifically, I'll go to the CMS. So CMS does not defragment the heap, it does not compact the heap at all, um, which means that you have two options. One is to get the tuning of CMS just right so that the compaction, the, the fragmentation doesn't happen, which is really, really hard, or you can trigger a full GC, which will be quite a long full GC, multi-second full GC every once in a while. So if your application is of the format where you can take it out, say if it's running in a cluster, you can take it out of the cluster, trigger a full GC, put it back in the cluster, or it's an application that runs over a strict period and then it terminates, then it's possible. That's what I mean by can manage fragmentation. It's possible, and then in that case, CMS is, is a good target to try. Um, I should add that CMS is available right up to all the JVMs that are available right now, but it's being removed in Java 14, in the upcoming Java 14. It's because it's really complex. There's like 70 tuning parameters. Nobody wants to support it anymore. Uh, Oracle are the ones who are supporting it, and it's just taking too much of their resources. They want to put it into other, these other collectors. So they've uh, stopped supporting it, or they want to stop supporting it. They've removed it in Java 14, and there's no open source group that's taken on um, maintaining it, so it's probably gone. But in any JVM that you're running currently, you can use CMS, um, and it's a good option if you can manage the fragmentation that it causes. If you can't, then you've got these other options, um, G1 parallel, the opt av average pause. So that is short for optimizing average pauses <laughs> in the garbage collector. The, the IBM garbage collectors have, have got very meaningful names that tell you exactly what they, they're targeted at. Um, and the balanced garbage collector, again in the IBM one, also is uh, it's, it's quite good. Um, it's not brilliant, but it's quite good, and it might hit those times. So that's... Um, that's the full flow there. I've got some more slides. Um, so we've just got, we've got time to, to go through some other useful things. There's a couple of useful flags. Uh, system GC in code is uh, amusingly common, but it's a bad practice. And you, can, you can tell the garbage collector just ignore any calls to system GC. And that's, that's a recommended practice. Um, and print flags final, I find, is a real help because it prints out the actual configuration that your JVM is running in and to whatever you're capturing in, in the logging. And it's very useful when you come to analyze, if there, especially if there's a problem, uh, because sometimes people say, I set, I, I did it, I set up one configuration, but actually the, the flags are different. Monitoring pause times from the... Uh, from the logs, also very straightforward. Now with the, uh, I'm, I'm only looking at the uh, Java 9 Plus, the, uh, the, the latest logs. They're very simple. They start with the word pause in the line. They give a description of what it is. And then they have this same format, which is the heap that was used before the GC, the heap that was used with an, an arrow, a heap that was used after the GC, the total heap size, and then the time taken for that. It's fairly straightforward, easy to process. Metaspace, I did mention that. Um, it's useful or important to know that Metaspace is using native memory. It's not part of the heap. Um, if you have a memory leak in Metaspace, which is unusual, but it can do, uh, typically, that's a class loader memory leak. You're, you're generating classes, and the class loader is reloading load and not unloading them for be, because you're keeping objects alive of all these generated classes. Um, but the objects themselves aren't large enough memory leak to notice, but the, heap, the, the metadata is. Um, that would be a, a, a memory leak. That's something that it'll, it'll actually blow your OS memory, um, not the JVM memory. You'll still get an out-of-memory error. Uh, and it should tell you that it was Metaspace related. Um, but it's just useful to know. So if you're monitoring your system, you need to know that Metaspace is on the native side. So you need to monitor the native side as well and, uh, and see um, what the, if, if the process is taking up size. And it can cause a full GC. So it, when Metaspace is expanded by the JVM, um, that will cause a full GC because it tries to empty it out. Uh, so if you're hitting that, 
then you probably want to avoid hitting it, and the way to avoid hitting it is increasing the metaspace size. So finally, if I go back to that flow, and if I go to the original before the latency tuning, it's all of this. And there's a little box on the right there that says code. So if you've tried everything with your tuning with your GCs, all the different GC options, you've gone through the flow, and you're still not achieving what you want to achieve in terms of your SLOs, even though you've tried this, this is where I'm going to next, which is what you do, and it's going to be at the code level. Um, the first thing is to look up the best GC that you got, the best whatever it is you ended up with. You're close or the closest you got to your SLOs, just have a look at it, have a look at the options it has available because they do have lower level tuning options. The main ones are resizing the young gen compared to the old gen. Um, uh, so that tends to be it. But a lot of them nowadays will resize the young gen themselves. So they should already be optimizing that. Um, Starting GC collections earlier, that's a very common choice with G1 and CMS. So there's a flag which says, trigger the GC at when the heap is this full um, for all of these. And you can set that to be a lower flag. It's a different flag for each GC. So I haven't put them here. Um, and that means just that it's the case, if it's the case where the GC isn't keeping up with the application, then it just triggers it earlier so it has more of a chance to keep up with the application. It's hard to get this right, and there's a lot of different tuning flags. Um, for me, it also makes it quite fragile, because then when you do an upgrade of your application, it's probably not, no longer right. So everything up to here is quite robust. It survives application upgrades, because it's pretty good. It's related to SLOs. Once you get into the lower level tuning aspects, it becomes fragile. Um, so you've tried that step or you've passed, bypassed it, look in the logs for finalizers and references, because they impact all the GCs really badly. Okay, so finalizers are where you're, you have implemented a finalized method in an object. That's a bad practice. It's already recommended that you do not do that, that you should use a reference object instead. Just look up any article on that. I'll tell you how to do that. Um, so if you have finalizers showing in your GC logs and it's taking time, just go in there and fix that in your code. Um, then if you're using reference, if reference processing is taking a long time, again, from the GC logs, you'll see it from the GC logs, just grep for references. Um, it'll tell you how long the reference is. Some of the GCs have the ability to flip to a faster mode of reference scanning. I think G1, for example, allows you to parallelize reference scanning. It isn't parallelized by default because that is less efficient on average, but on um, the average case where you don't have a lot of references. But if there is a lot of references, you can flip that on. But even better is to actually go down to the code and fix why you're using references. Because you shouldn't have a lot of references in there. There should be quite only a few. And if you don't know where they are, just have a look up for reference objects, weak references, uh, soft, uh, soft res references, um, phantom references if you're really, really guru level uh, in, uh, in Java, and you'll understand them. But at the GC level, you just want to minimize those. So go back to the developers if you're not the developer and say, guys, this is taking time and this is bad. Next step. So those two, the finalizing references uh, are biggies in GC. Next step is that the allocation rate, how fast you allocate objects, limits how, if, how well the GC can manage. So all the recent GCs, like ZGC, Shenandoah, they actually limit your allocation rate. Um, not the whole time, but if the GC can't keep up with your allocation, it slows down your allocation. Remember, the, the garbage collector is responsible for, for the whole object lifecycle, including object allocation, so it can do that. And the way it does that is basically uh, there's a code in there that just says um, you can't you, you, it pauses on the allocation. Pretty much that's how it does it. Um, so it can slow it down, but regardless of whether it can slow it down, uh, and there are other GCs that can't, uh, and it just won't keep up, either way, you should know your allocation rate. It's important to have a look at it, see what it is. And there are some rules of thumb, like 300 megabytes per second, which is quite a lot of allocation. 
um, is, should be okay. That she, you should be able to find a GC that can handle it. And between 300 and a gig, it varies, and above a gig, typically we don't see GCs being able to handle um, that level. It can't keep up, basically. And what happens when a garbage collector can't keep up? It's only got two options. It can either slow down your allocation, or it can just stop your uh, application with a, a stop the world pause. Um, and they vary as to which they do. CMS does that one, ZGC does that one. It's, it's all varied. So allocation rate is quite important. And you should know it for your application. And then the last choice here is, um, yeah, big objects. Um, obviously, that's a large array rather than an object with a lot of, uh, it's, it's hard to create a really big object with a lot of fields. So it's typically a large array. Um, they tend to be problematic for garbage collectors because the garbage collector ideally wants to move objects in memory. And if you're moving a large object, that's very inefficient. So what they do is there's usually a, a limitation about how big an object they'll move. Um, and otherwise, they'll pin them in memory to where they are. And then that, that becomes kind of a difficult thing for the garbage collector to manage. So really, what you want to do at the code level is A, pre-size collections so that they're already as big as they reach. Um, and B, make sure that anything large is something that's a long-lived object. Because then it's quickly going to get into the old generation or somewhere where the, the garbage collector is happy for objects to stay for a long time. You can edit the object in place, that's all right, but it having to move the object is, is painful. Um, and there are some GCs that have humongous object processing in the GC logs, and you can track that, just script for that, and see whether it's taking a long time. That's kind of it. Um, this is who I am. I work for Expedia. It said Hotels.com. Hotels.com is part of the Expedia brand. Um, that's the Expedia brand. A lot of things. Uh, if you want to go on holiday anywhere, this, we're the biggest holiday travel agent in the world because of all of that combination. Um, I was working in the hotels brand. I'm now a cross brand. Um, I work in a performance reliability engineering team. I founded a website called javaperformancetuning.com and I wrote a book and I publish a, week, a monthly newsletter on performance tuning. So that's, that's who I am. And that's the end of the talk. I will leave it with this tuning flow up here. And I can take questions, if there are any. And if there aren't, it means that you get to be first in queue for lunch. <laughs>